Uh, what do you think, Alexis? Have we given enough people or uh, people enough time to get here from the plenary, or do you want to give people another minute? No, I think sure. If you're if we're ready to go, let's do this. Great. Yeah. Okay, great. Ani, Alexis and Dijna Kaz, Wipi Oshawa and Donjaba. I am part of the Williams Treaty, and my closest treaty partner is the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation. I am fourth generation newcomer, and I am thankful to be here with you today because of the sharing of this land. Welcome to Modeling Imperfection and Reflection, centering equity and justice in youth civic action. I am so pleased to be moderating today's session. I teach high school students with the Durham District School Board in Ontario, and I was blessed with being um, introduced to this incredible organization in 2007. For 14 school years, I have been the lead in running the YPI programming in my schools. The opportunities for my students to connect and engage with local community partners has been invaluable and has added an aspect to our civics program that works to support the account accountability of our young people in the pursuit of equity. I have been witness to the growth and the willingness to change and adapt to the needs of our youth. And I am so proud of what this team has been driven to accomplish. Holly and Noor are here with us today to share some of their current resources and to hopefully inspire you as I was 15 years ago to bring this awesome initiative to your students. So without further ado, ado, Noor and Holly, thank you so much for being here with us today. Alexis, thank you so much for welcoming us. Thank you for welcoming everybody to here today. And, um, and my, my extension to you all, thank you for joining us from wherever you are across Turtle Island. And uh, good morning or good afternoon. Um, my name is Holly McClellan. We're going to begin with some personal introductions by honoring and recognizing the land that Noor and I are both joining you from today. And we invite you to do the same. If you if you want to, please do in the, in the chat box, you're welcome uh, to introduce yourself, name, uh, pronouns, if you like, and uh, an indication of um, the land on which you're joining us from today. So again, my name is Holly McClellan. I use she and her pronouns. I am a white settler and second generation European immigrant to Turtle Island, and I'm joining you from uh, traditional territory of Ashnali and Haudenosaunee peoples, um, Treaty 13 in Tr Toronto, Toronto. Um, and I am the uh, executive director of YPI, and I've, I've been with YPI for uh, 11 years. And I'll pass it over to Noor. Thanks so much, Holly. Welcome, everybody. My name is Noor El Husseini. You can call me Noor. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm a second generation refugee and settler to Turtle Island, uh, the commonly used term among Indigenous communities to refer to North America as a whole predating uh, colonization and the separation of the land. And I'm co leading this workshop with Holly. I'm connecting with you from my home office here today in Ottawa on the un unceded Algonquin land on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe. And I'm YPI's national program co-director and feel free to jump into the chat and introduce yourselves and I'll, I'll pass it back to you Holly. No problem. So this artwork is by Mitchif Métis artist Christy Belcourt. It is called Our Lives Are in the Land. Land recognition is a tradition of showing appreciation and respect that goes back centuries in many Indigenous cultures. Today it is an act of reconciliation and a practice for settlers as well that reminds us of our relationship to the land where we live, work, and learn, and asks us to consider how we are honoring and upholding the rights of Indigenous people. We encourage all teachers in this session to visit the Yellowhead Institute to learn more about land back, reclaiming Indigenous jurisdiction jurisdiction and breathing life into rights and responsibilities. And thanks, Nora, for sharing the link in the chat. And they have great resources for high school students. And I'll jump in, Holly, just to add that throughout the session today, everybody um, will be using the terms Indigenous and non-Indigenous as we are settlers here. That's the most appropriate term for Holly, terms for Holly and I to use. Uh, however, you know, we say that with the recognition that there's a huge diversity of cultures, traditions, customs, uh, practices among different Indigenous communities across Turtle Island. And so they may choose, of course, to self-identify in very different ways. Um, but during this session, we'll be using the terms Indigenous Indigenous and non-Indigenous, unless we're uh, directly citing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, who might use other terms like Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal. Um, and just to be clear, again, Turtle Island is the term, uh, it predates the division of the land into separate colonies or countries, and so we refer to that, we use that term uh, in, in solidarity with, with Indigenous ways of knowing and doing. And so to jump right in, we want to acknowledge it's been 
a really challenging time, for lack of better word. Um, the question, how are you, uh, is a very loaded question um, these days, particularly with students, with teachers and their families. And so we just want you to know, we want to acknowledge it's been a difficult time, uh, difficult in many degrees, um, and that YPI, we always try to, you know, we have, um, we center sort of the well-being of our teachers and our students um, through compassion and relationship building. And so we sincerely hope that you and your loved ones and your communities are keeping as safe, uh, as healthy and as well as you can uh, during what is yet another unpredictable school year. And so if you're feeling comfortable to give Holly and I a sense of your energy levels today on a scale of one to five, feel free to let us know in the chat. You know, one being I'm coming today, I'm, I'm, I'm fatigued, I'm burnt out or fire out there uh, and five being you know I'm energized I'm excited I'm ready three being sort of somewhere in the middle of that and so if you're comfortable feel free to check in in the chat uh, let us know you know how you how, how your energy levels are at um, and thanks Alexis for modeling and jumping in I can personally share I'm feeling I'm at a I'm at a three or a four today um, and so uh, Holly you're welcome to, to share as well and I'll pass it off to you I see some twos some threes Thanks, Albert, a 4.5. Feel free to use the point system. Five, Diane, thanks. Here you, Jenny. Feel Here free you to- Jenny, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm hovering between a, a three and a half and a four and a half right now, but I'm feeling really more and more energized uh, as we move through this and being, being here with you all. Um, so just a quick overview of today's um, community agreements, priorities and objectives guiding today's session. We really have three real main goals for today, for our time together, a very short time together. Um, we wanna demonstrate accountability to and solidarity with young people and equity seeking community members and other work with the equity deserving, um, historically oppressed and, um, and currently oppressed. Um, the second is to support you with practical ideas, takeaways and resources for you to reflect on your role in supporting equity and justice in your community. Um, and the third is we, you know, we'd love to inspire you to enroll in YPI. Uh, we'd love to work with you and your school. So this session is going to challenge us all, this all. Um, I want to name that there, there may be feelings of discomfort, uh, defensiveness, things might come up. Um, and this is just my invitation uh, on behalf of myself and Noor uh, to move towards any discomfort you're feeling. It's really an indicator of learning um, and, uh, and really take care of yourself through this session. Um, some of the things that we're sharing is um, difficult knowledge or difficult truths. Thanks so much, Holly. And so everyone, we wanted to start the session with a few reflection prompts as you see on the screen. So if you, you have a piece of paper or you're on a laptop or you have your phone out and you prefer to type away into sort of a notepad application on your phone, um, feel free to take a moment to, to let us know, you know, why are you here in this session today? What are your intentions coming in? What brought you in today? Um, and uh, to take another moment to jot down some words, ideas about how you feel currently about facilitating discussions about equity, racism, social justice with students or with young people or with colleagues um, and why that might be. And so we'll give everyone a minute just to jot down some initial ideas and we'll, we'll revisit um, some of these intentions uh, and these prompts in a moment. Um, so Holly, I'll pass it off to you and we'll, we'll give folks some time to just jot down some initial, uh, some initial ideas. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just stay quiet for another 30 seconds or so to give you a, a chance to write some stuff down and then I'll offer my own reflection. So I'll, I'll, I'll share um, just as an example of um, the, an answer to the reflection prompts that we're, uh, we're asking you for today. And this is for, uh, we'll revisit these at the end. Uh, you won't need to share these uh, um, openly. Uh, you can uh, keep these um, uh, for, uh, uh, for your own learning. Um, but a reflection, something that brings me here today is, um, um, an acknowledgement of uh, the, the harm that is ongoing um, uh, for racialized and marginalized students, teachers, and community members. Um, that as a white leader of an organization, it is uh, a privilege for me to learn about the impacts of racism without experiencing them. 
Um, I come with humility and a sense of urgency. Um, and it, I acknowledge that I also carry the privilege and power to opt out of conversations and that this decision is not neutral. Um, it's actually an act of, of um, uh, complacency in, in the harm and, and violence that are um, experienced every single day by racialized and marginalized uh, folks, community members, neighbors, family members. Um, we're here to make mistakes. None of this is perfect, um, and uh, but it's uh, here to be committed to to uh, to the work that we're in relationship with my team, in relationship with teachers. And so, just wanted to give a quick overview of what what it is we're talking about. What is the Youth and Philanthropy Initiative? And so, we're a public foundation that does all of our grant making through the decisions of high school students. So every year we work with our network of funders, high schools and charities, and we grant hundreds of thousands of dollars to local charities, 100% based on the research and peer-to-peer -peer advocacy of tens of thousands of grade nine and 10 students all across the country. So our mission is to support immediate social justice issues and needs in communities across the country uh, as decided and advocated by students and we're trying to do that in a way that contributes to the conditions for systemic social change over the long term so really looking at philanthropy as justice not charity we're working with over 100 schools and we were founded 20 years ago and in 2002 this was a pretty radical idea to shift power entirely to young people and today we're still disrupting the usual power and privilege dynamic in philanthropy by doing that by shifting um, the, the decision-making power to young people. However, it wasn't until about February of 2020 when, um, when we welcomed Noor to the team uh, that we really started to be deeply intentional and critical about the way that uh, our, the, the approach we were taking to youth civic engagement and how that was showing up in our programming and resources and what we needed to do to do the transformational work in ourselves and in our programming in order to do the transformational change that we wanted to see in, in um, the culture as well. And so Nora is going to walk you through some of these uh, resources that we share in our workshop. Um, again, this is a very quick version of, uh, of what we do and um, hopefully um, the uh, Thanks so much, Holly. So uh, to everybody listening in the room today, um, what you see in front of you is part of an interactive activity that we run in a workshop with our students and our teachers. And so um, the, the visual representations that you see up on the screen uh, were modified from the work of art educator Paul Kuttner. And the definitions that you see below those visual images or representations uh, were adapted and modified, really informed by the work of the 519, which is a wonderful um, community organization that exists in Toronto. And so, you know, through the session, we walk students through from left to white, from left to right, the difference between equality, equity, and justice. And we do that by looking at some of the symbols that show up in these images. And so we see that it's a baseball game. We're not talking about baseball here. We're talking about uh, students and their families and different groups um, being able to access uh, and have you know, whole fulfilling lives, to be able to live abundantly with the things that they need, moving out of survival mode, moving out of being uh, systemically oppressed. And so that's what the metaphor of the baseball game is, is really trying to get at. You'll notice a slanted front, uh, slanted fence, uh, highest uh, on the right hand side going down towards the left. Uh, that fence uh, represents the roadblocks, the barriers, the uh, forms of oppression that students and their families encounter. And we'll get into a bit more details shortly. You'll notice there are three young people, three students or three groups. We don't know anything about them. We don't know um, anything about their identity, their preferred pronouns. All we know is that they're distinguished by color. So, you know, blue on the on the left, red in the center, yellow on the on the right. Then we notice that they're standing on some boxes or some crates. Um, these are the forms of support that these different students or their families might need. Um, and then for the purposes of the YPI program, we look at those forms of support through the charity uh, charities, um, the programs and services that charities provide uh, once they select a social issue. And then you'll finally notice the very bottom there, um, 
the ground, the turf, the grass is unleveled. It's highest on the left and lowest on the right. Um, and so this, this uneven, unleveled ground represents the different starting points, right? We don't all start from the same place. Uh, we take into account power, we take into account privilege, unearned wealth, hoarded wealth uh, in the context of, of um, these different students or these different groups that they might represent. And so moving from left to right, we see that equal treatment, i.e. equality, doesn't necessarily mean that every student has equal access to living abundantly, to living fulfilled, wholesome lives where they have everything that they need to thrive. And so students can quickly identify that equality isn't enough. Um, and they use examples, they provide examples like through the pandemic, um, you know, giving every student the exact same device and not accounting for difference, not thinking about the context that they're coming from might not necessarily lead to the same academic outcomes. Um, so students make these very real connections um, to, to the inadequacy of an equality approach. The next uh, middle image, we're looking at equity. And so in this image, we see that um, there are different forms of support uh, that are given uh, and, um, uh, to different groups of people in order to have equal access in seeing over the fence or overcoming the barriers. And so this takes into account the different starting points, right? Uh, the different advantages and disadvantages that one might uh, be experiencing due to systemic oppression. And so students quickly understand that, you know, giving support the giving the support that's needed for that particular context is not like an act of pity, an act of charity, an act of, you know, they quickly recognize that these are supports that are owed, these are supports that are needed. Students know what's happening. Um, they have, a, you know, they're connected to social media, they're connected to the world. Uh, they don't leave their lived experiences outside the door of the school system. They bring them in when they walk into schools. And so they quickly recognize equity means basing the supports um, and resources on the particular context of the student and their families, depending on the social barriers or social issues that they're confronting. Now, before I move on to justice, I wanna take a moment here to recognize that fence. Um, we make a point to really communicate to the students as well as the teachers that the barrier isn't that I might be a black student. The barrier is anti-black racism or that racism exists, that's the fence. The barrier isn't that I, there's something wrong with me for uh, living with a disability or having uh, exceptional ways of learning or requiring other forms of knowing and doing in the classroom. That's not the barrier. The barrier is ableism. That's the fence. And so that, that example is used with, with any social issue that they select, right? The barrier isn't that I'm facing homelessness and that's my fault. The barrier is that we live in a capitalistic society that pushes people out of being able to have affordable housing. Students can quickly recognize the barriers. Um, and oftentimes it's just really important to have young people and their families know that the blame is not with them because students internalize these ideas about themselves, that they're not enough, right? And so that's why the systemic approach, the policies, the practices and procedures to the frameworks, those fences are really, really important. So the, that fence represents homophobia, transphobia, ableism, capitalism, racism, you name it. That's what the fence is talking about in this image. And so finally, we move on to justice. We see that the, the, those framework, those barriers, those systems of oppression are being dismantled. There's some action in this image. And you notice that the student in blue who has the most advantage, the ground is the highest, and who has the lowest of systemic barriers, they still have a fence in front of them. So it doesn't mean that they're not experiencing barriers. Um, so, you know, but we see that that's, that student or that group is actively participating in dismantling the barrier in that last image. They might be, they seem to be the only student that might have a tool um, to be able to do that. And so there's uh, a fight, the fight for liberation um, is something that involves everybody. When you take down the frameworks, the barriers, the systems of oppression that are, are preventing students and their families and, and teachers from living fulfilled and whole lives, you don't need equity anymore. You don't need to spend resources on accommodating people because now we live in a, in a society that everybody and their contexts are represented. It's inclusive by design in its foundation. 
not through band-aids you know it's inclusive in its its conception and so we're not quite there yet but students recognize that they're activists groups uh, uh, grassroots organizations, community organizations that are working towards justice. And so why do we share this? Why do we share this with our students? Two reasons. One, we want to equip them with the language and we want them to um, recognize that equality isn't enough anymore. The second reason is that we want, when we ask them when they're picking a social issue and we ask them to research a charity, we strongly encourage them to look at charities that are equity seeking or oriented or serving or justice oriented because we've now understood through the workshop session why equality isn't enough. And so that's really the, the purpose of, um, of the workshop. And so if we were to move ahead, the next thing that we discuss in the workshop is reconciliation. And so we share this exact slide where we talk about the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, including uh, the 94 calls to action. And we do this uh, for several reasons, but we also share um, this definition because we don't want to assume that everybody is uh, is aware, we understand that school systems sometimes, like many institutions, don't necessarily share um, this information, this important history. And so we walk them through reconciliation. You can see the definition up there and students quickly recognize why an apology isn't enough. If you break down that second point, the, the atonement uh, for the causes, the apology is the third thing that is, is asked, right? And oftentimes it's the first thing we start with and it's where we stop. And so students quickly understand um, that reconciliation requires a relationship with the truth first, and then the steps that need to be taken before we, we get to an action to change our behavior. As part of their definition, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada also says that reconciliation is not an Aboriginal problem. In other words, it's it's not a Canadian problem. It's, uh, excuse me, it's not an indig Indigenous only problem. It's a Canadian problem. It requires the entirety of our society to be part of that process. So as part of that quotation on reconciliation, the TRC also says that virtually all aspects of Canadian society might need to be, may need to be reconsidered for that to really happen. When students are selecting their social issue, we have them think about their social issue in relation to how it connects to um, Indigenous sovereignty and right to self-determination. I want to be clear that Indigenous uh, sovereignty and right to self-determination is very different and is not the same as equity work. We're talking about the first inhabitants of this land. Very different than talking about accommodating people's differences. There's a different um, fight uh, for liberation happening in those two pieces there. But what students can understand when we talk about reconciliation, so let's say they choose anti-Indigenous racism. Let's say they choose the missing and murdered Indigenous women. Let's say they choose to celebrate Indigenous ways of knowing through their research projects. Let's say they choose to, if they choose to do that, they can, they can quickly make that connection with this definition and, and, and what's being asked of them. But let's say they choose something like housing, right? Or something like trans, uh, transphobia. The connection we like to make with students uh, through this uh, definition that was given by the TRC is that like homophobia, poverty, um, racism, um, ableism, it's not the problem of the people or group that are most harmed or impacted by it. It's a Canadian problem. All at, it involves all of us, right? Like if we're feminist, if we're thinking about feminism, like feminism involves non-binary, and men and other, it's not just a problem for people who self-identify as women or girls. And so that's sort of the connection that we, that we um, make in relation to when they're picking their social issue, to remember that it calls on the entirety of our society to be involved um, for, that, for that collective repair and that collective healing and for justice to be served. Now, moving forward into the next slide, 
we talk about um, reconciliation, now that we have a shared understanding with the students and the teacher, we talk about this quote that was given to us um, by the Honorable Marie Sinclair, who was the former Chief Justice of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We let our students and our teachers know if this is the first time you're hearing about him, we strongly encourage you to, to get familiar with the work and to get familiar with the work of the TRC. And so this, this part of the, the, the uh, workshop, when we share it with our teachers and our students, we're trying to get them to think about the distinction that um, the Honorable Marie Sinclair is trying to make. And so this idea of what's the difference between, you know, saying a recognition of rights, one side sees it as a recognition of rights, and the other side sees it as an act of benevolence. And we say an act of generosity, an act of kindness, sometimes even an act of charity, or even an act of philanthropy, if you have a, a different uh, understanding or a more colonized understanding of, of philanthropy. And so students, when we ask students this question, you know, we're really trying to ask them to, the difference between an approach to justice and an approach, a kindness and generosity approach. And so one student um, had shared, if we can jump ahead, Holly, to the next slide, what you see on the next slide is the response that one student gave at the top there uh, about their reflections on, on, on that distinction. And so they say a kindness and generosity approach is kind of like holding the door open for somebody. You don't have to do it. And it makes you look good and feel rewarded. In other words, referring to Holly's uh, reflection prompt that she shared with all of us as to why she's here, you can opt in and opt out of philanthropy, generosity, and kindness. You can decide when you want to be kind or generous or charitable in some cases. A justice approach is a recognition of the moral and legal obligation to act and do something, whether you or the, are, are a part of that group, you belong to that group, or you identify with that group or not. Injustice is injustice. So you can't opt out of it. It calls on everybody, the collective, for all of us to be involved, virtually all aspects of our society. And th those of us within that society um, need, to, need, to, need to reconsider some things, right? And so justice is a call to act. Students can quickly make that distinction. Um, students make the distinction that generosity can sometimes be disrespectful. Um, it can be from a stance of pity. It can be from a stance of look how nice we are to have done something uh, that, that we owe that is, has been stolen from you. Um, they make these connections, right? And our teachers tell us that, that they learn from the workshop as well. Um, and so going back to the tensions now, thinking about some of the tensions that exist, uh, a, a recognition of rights approach, a human rights approach is not a perfect approach. And this is not um, echoing a criticism towards the Honorable Marie Sinclair by any, any, uh, any uh, means. We're generally talking about human rights frameworks and how there can be tensions uh, within a, a human rights approach. The idea being, you know, who gets to, who, you know, the notion that uh, a group of people or an institution that is likely not to necessarily be at the forefront of feeling the impact of their human rights not being upheld or being violated can make decisions as to who gets human rights and who doesn't. Uh, they get to grant that power, you know, they grant us others rights, right? Um, and so there's a, there's a tension there between that and then also the necessity of policies, right? Policies are necessary. Why are policies necessary in justice work? You know, if we look at the work of Dr. Cindy Blackstock, who's litigated against the federal government and will continue to do so, if you don't have policy, you don't have protection. And so there's this tension between, you know, having to use the legal system, which is like all our systems designed, they're not broken systems. They're systems that were designed to fail certain groups of people over others. So the system is live and well, it is doing what it was designed to do. And so for those of us that are working towards justice, you have to then use the system to push back. And the system is flawed as we see in the idea of granting rights, having someone be able to decide who gets your rights or not. And so this idea that students can quickly connect that you know, charities, the charities that they research for their, uh, for their social issue, like those charities can't rectify or solve the problems of the community. Homelessness is a policy decision. Without policy, there's no protection for those folks. 
these are policy decisions that need to be in place. And the same goes for data, right? We have data that has been uh, historically collected by communities for decades that were not deemed valuable, discredited because it was coming from communities and not institutions and researchers uh, that centers uh, certain ways of knowing over others or prioritize certain ways of knowing over others. And so you have this need, this recognition among our students that, you know, data, this idea of getting them in touch with the data um, related to their social issue and data can look like research. It can look like the lived experiences of those who are the most impacted by the systemic oppression. So we make the connection to our students that within these tensions, when we think about equity and we think about justice, a commitment to equity is a commitment to the data the research, the lived experiences, the wisdom that, that has been pushed forward by many, many people and groups. A commitment to justice then becomes a commitment to act upon the data, to do something. And so what does this mean in terms of our, our uh, given the system that we're in, what does this mean for youth civic engagement? I'll pass it off to Holly to walk us through um, some, of those, uh, some of those pieces. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Noor. Um, thanks for walking us through the, the, the system as it is working. It's working just fine um, to exclude and, and oppress uh, um, uh, different groups. Um, so we, when we work with students, so really the potential of, of youth civic engagement, um, the, the real potential that we see is inclusion, liberation, and transformation for ourselves the ways that we relate to each other and, and in our cultures and in our, in our futures that we want. Um, we are trying to help students to interact with the data of their communities, uh, data from, uh, in, by being in building relationships with each other, um, by uh, building relationships with leaders and people who are working every day on uh, social justice in their own communities. Um, we're helping them to appreciate the need for those, uh, the immediate need for those boxes in the, the previous diagram that Nora walked us through, but we're really supporting them um, we're, to see those fences and to see themselves as, as actors and, and uh, pulling different levers and taking those fences down. Um, the pitfalls, uh, given that we are, and this is coming from, this is like deep reflection <laughs> after being, um, you know, uh, in this work for, for over a decade um, and just reflecting on um, the uh, sharing what we have been doing to deeply criticize, critique our own approach and our own programming and um, recognizing that we are at the intersection, we are operating um, at three sectors, the education, charitable and philanthropic sector in Canada and in, uh, across uh, this land um, that are inherently Eurocentric and we're built on foundations of white supremacy. And so acknowledging that um, we see that if we don't take a systemic approach that really deeply centers equity and justice at the core of everything we do, we, we run the risk of, of, um, of complacency, of actually of becoming about charity and not justice, or about um, being uh, co-opted by the status quo or co-opted into adult agendas of what, um, uh, what youth civic engagement should be for. And so um, one of the things that we've seen, um, we've taken too much credit and received too much credit for um, helping to engage, quote unquote, disengaged uh, students in, um, through YPI. Uh, and so want to problematize that um, for ourselves with, uh, it's not that we're offering anything um, that the students shouldn't already have access to in terms of seeing themselves represented, seeing these important issues that they would like to talk about. And so when we think about the role of ourselves as educators and the role of education ourselves, uh, when we label students as disengaged or low performing or non-academic, what data are we ourselves missing about that student? So who are they? What identities do they hold? What, does, uh, what is their culture? How might they be perceived in and by society? Um, how might that be affecting the way that they're showing up in their classroom? 
Um, we want young people, we want to support them to critically question, disrupt, and resist the status quo and an adult-centered ways of knowing and learning. And we recognize that as adults, we as, as organization leaders and, and teachers, uh, we both hold power and privilege, and we hold a, a vital role in, uh, and believe teachers play a vital role in um, in students' self-confidence, their self-perception, achievement, emotional and social well-being. And so we are looking at what, what can we actually learn from young people? How might they be challenging us in ways that are asking us to reflect on our own positions of power, privilege, and our comfort levels? And they're not failing us by refusing to assimilate or by challenging preconceived notions about power and authority. This is, this is actually what is going to, to cause the shift that, uh, that we really so, so desperately need to see. Um, and so Nor will go into this in a little bit more detail. Um, one of the pitfalls that comes up as well is that given the lack, sometimes not the lack of the, the um, the disconnection from data, from valuing data that is coming, that is present in communities. Um, uh, students can, um, when given the opportunity to, or a platform to share about a social issue that matters to them without, um, without informed consent processes um, and, by, and by being uh, connected to the charitable sector in Canada, which does rely heavily on sharing trauma, traumatic stories about um, the, uh, the folks that the charities um, are working with. Uh, the students can actually um, go into that themselves as well and actually share personal traumatic stories uh, as a way to try to show that they're um, the social issue that they want to, to um, to advocate for is is worthy of 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 listening to and of respect and so this is a, a deep deep learning um, that we have done over the last 18 to, to 20 months and so nor will actually walk us through that because this is a, an important um whether um whether a school is participating in our program or not it's a very important le le learning that we would like to share about that and about building in um consent processes so that um students who are engaging in youth civic education are not um, being asked to perform their their trauma in order to meet the expectations of, of adults and um, and to uphold the sort of status quo ideas about what charity is. Thanks so much, Holly. And so what you'll see um, for the participants that are here today, what you'll see is sort of how this has affected our programming. This is sort of a little bit of a list, but I'm really going to focus on the first two. Um, Holly spoke a little bit to um, the deep conversations that we've been having internally as a team, um, the way that Holly and I have had to relationship build as a you know white leader and a racialized uh, a racialized uh, sort of co-leader, um, and what that means for our uh, the honesty and humility that needs to come through from from both of us, and so that gets built in, and and, and who we're accountable to gets built into point uh, three that you see on the screen. Holly just spoke to the metric of success and and defining our metric of success. So if we're uh, fostering critical conversations and students that are resisting the system um, and being resistant uh, to teachers that might be um, pushing uh, white supremacy culture or characteristics on them, that is a good sign if students are becoming resistant um, and equipped and that teachers are also becoming resistant to the status quo. And then you'll see some points about our curriculum where we talk about intersectionality um, through the work of Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined that term, um, and then some other pieces around creativity and how we invite that into the project so that students from all different um, sort of learning uh, with from all different learning needs, different talents, different passions, different gifts can bring themselves into their presentations and not just a formal presentation that caters to extroverted students, that caters to students that are comfortable with public speaking. Public speaking is one of the top fears that young people and adults have like before death. Um, that is a real, a real um, fear that a lot of people are like anxiety that a lot of people have. And then um, some piece about inclusive, uh, inclusive uh, programming and how our programming is inclusive. We're really hoping that for those of you that are unfamiliar with our work, we can, you know, uh, build a relationship with you and having you walking you through some of these points in, in, in greater depth, but I'll focus on the first two. And so 
uh, Talking about the student care and ethics guide, this was a guide that we put together um, to really center uh, ethical considerations when it comes to working with young people and young uh, and youth. And Holly sort of alluded and spoken to sort of the way that young people might feel compelled or encouraged to share um, personal stories that are deeply painful, um, that are deeply traumatic uh, with their experiences with particular social issues without any sort of trained professional on site. No one who's trauma informed on site social workers, you know, we understand guidance counselors are put in really tough places, especially with uh, uh, larger class sizes and cutbacks to education. Um, it's, it's really not uh, feasible for one counselor to have, you know, over 150 to 200 students at some points to be able to support them through some of these pieces. And so we're not blaming individual people. Um, but what happens is that students, it signals to students that you know, especially if they're rewarded for that behavior, if they're called brave, if they're called inspiring. Um, I think sometimes we, we don't quite think about what we're reinforcing in our students when we use those terms around bravery. You're, you're congratulating a student uh, or a family or a young person on their ability to with, with, withstand the hurt and harm of the system, something they shouldn't have to do in the first place. And so um, I remember I do a lot of spoken word poetry workshops, and I remember when I, I use storytelling as a way to um, for students to tell their own stories, to tell their counter narrative to the narrative that's being written for them, about them, without them. And I had a racialized student ask me, like, when can I stop being strong? Students don't want to be resilient. They just want to be children. They want to be young people. They want to not have to face the barriers that they're facing. And so the student ethics of care, it kind of walks students through some of that informed consent. Consent is not signing a media release form at the beginning of the year and never talking about it again. Consent is ongoing. Um, young people oftentimes think, think they, they, they have to share things uh, because they have to, you know, because there's an adult in the room, because they think it might gain them favor or access to certain spaces or things, right? They don't, they shouldn't have to. And quite frankly, it's not always safe for them to share. Um, and so this guide kind of, you know, the aim of this guide is to really support students and our teachers around some of those key considerations. This idea that you don't have to tell your personal story, that, you know, around privacy and digital imprint and, and other, other key pieces to that. And I can tell you that many teachers have, have shared with me when I walk them through this, this resource, they say, this is something that happened, that's already happened will happen, happens in our boards, happens in our relationships with, uh, with our, our students sometimes. Um, and so it's really useful, um, whether it's within YPI programming or not. And that's, that's what it's there for. And so it, the work was inspired actually through the research of um, Dr. Shireen Rezak and Dr. Elizabeth Ellsworth. I've pasted uh, the articles uh, that helped me uh, create this resource with my team into the chat, but just know that they're available at the end of the session as well with, with the hyperlinks if you're about reading uh, uh, about the problematics of thinking that you as adults empower young people, that you grant them that power when really we render them powerless. Um, and so that's what those two articles sort of speak to. Um, the second Yes. Oh, Nora, just doing a little time check. I know we we were delayed in starting. So if everyone's okay, we will wrap up at 1220 um, or just in a couple of minutes. Um, and I know, Alexis, you need to help people with instructions on where to go. I wondered, Nora, if we should move ahead to the list of teacher resources and support and uh, or make mention of the, um, the teacher support. And I can go to I can go to the slide with all of their links. Sure. We, have, yeah. we have actually created a micro site for everybody, like a little, um, it's just a web page of all of our uh, links for everything for t all of the resources that we talked about today. And I'll put that up as Nora talks about the teacher support. I'll just offer. wrap it up quickly. We've talked a bit about the ethics and care guide. When it comes to teacher support, overwhelmingly, uh, we have teachers that are asking for resources and supports really support in discussing social issues or social justice issues with their students. Um, and to be quite frank, more often than not, it comes from white cis men and women who have difficulty relating uh, to their students that might be racialized and marginalized by the system. And what you see on the screen are some of the forms of resistance that come up. These are direct things that we've heard from our teachers, that we hear from adults constantly around why they're struggling with doing this work. And so we've put together um, 
a teacher webinar that's happening next week on how to have difficult conversations with students as a direct response to that, that there's learning that us as adults need to do to be able to show up for our students. And so if you see yourself in any of those reasons um, that were up on the screen a moment ago, um, that's the work that we're trying to do with our teachers is if, if moving beyond um, some of these reasons and excuses for opting out of why we don't do the work. Um, and so Holly, I'll pass it off to you to, that's the summary of resources for everybody. I'll put the links uh, in the chat while Holly walks us through what, what these resources are, are hoping to support you with. Thank you, Nora, for putting these links directly in the chat. If you click on them right away, then they'll be open in your browsers and then you can look at them in your own time. Um, Nora's put together a YPI reading list for equity and justice resources for teachers. And then that second link is uh, one specifically for you with all the resources from today. And what we would, what just to summarize what we shared today, what these resources will help you in deeper understanding is that number one, in understanding that Indigenous sovereignty and right to self-determination is not the same as equity work, um, a commitment to understanding the truth and getting familiar with the data um, and finding uh, uh, communities and local organizations and leaders in your communities that are actively working towards uh, race-based data collection. Um, resources to support you in understanding characteristics of white supremacy culture and how to identify it within yourself and those around you and considering who wields power and influence within your school and organization and who doesn't. Uh, a commitment to support you in making a commitment to actively stopping yourself or those around you from using deficit-based narratives or negative language about students understanding and accepting that equity work is messy and in order to do it well discomfort and disruption is required and to quote Dr. Kevin Kumashiro the stance of certainty is the greatest barrier to anti-oppression and, and we also share some resources on how you can learn and explore intersectionality which is coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw to understand and implement it as an analytical tool and of course we are we would love to welcome you. Our program is free for public schools, comes with a $5,000 grant for your students to award um, to uh, equity and justice uh, centered charities in their communities and uh, reach out if, you, if you'd like to get in touch and talk more about what we talked about today, talk about YPI for your school. Um, we're just, we would love to, to talk with teachers anytime. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. We say, that, we say that also just to welcome everybody at any point of your learning as a partner. We're not perfect. Uh, our, our, we're working on doing better as we know better, uh, to use the words of Maya Angelou. And so we're not perfect, but we're willing to own our mistakes, make mistakes, have open, honest, relational conversations with each other where defenses and egos are down, all for the sake of our collective humanity so that we don't dehumanize ourselves and we don't dehumanize others in the process. And so if you are committed and dedicated, trying to do better, wanting to know better to do better, we invite you in to partner with us um, as we you know, move through this in a very imperfect way. Um, but some would say that the greater disservice is not trying at all, not having the conversation at all. Hope that you'll be in conversation with us. Thank you so much, Noor and Holly. Our space is filled with voice so much these days through those we surround ourselves with, through our social media, through news agencies. Um, the voices who filled our space for the last 45 minutes were so worth hearing. And I wanna reiterate how proud I am of the team at YPI for taking on this challenging work and for looking at how they themselves fill the space of education and what our youth take away from this work. Um, so Chi Miigwech for sharing with us. Um, thank you for everyone uh, for being here as well. You know, as, as Nora pointed out at the beginning, I know it's a challenging time for all of us. So thank you for filling your space with the right voices today. Um, I just wanted to indicate uh, for the next half an hour. So until 1245, uh, you are encouraged to please check out the exhibit hall and the pre-recorded sessions. There are some incredible sessions in there, including decolonizing skateboarding, which is one I'm definitely gonna be listening to. So do take a look at those. Um, and then at 12.45 um, Eastern Standard Time, 11.45 Central Time and 10.45 Mountain Time, we will be welcoming our keynote speaker, Nigan Sinclair, um, which is definitely not something that you will want to miss either. So thank you so much, ladies. Thank you to everyone. Um, 
Anor and Holly do have another session coming up for Halifax, but I think they might hang out for a second if you had any questions or concern or yeah, I wanted to follow up, sorry, with any of that information and those links. Um, otherwise, concerns are fine. Back. <laughs> yeah, 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 any questions? Yeah, open but, yeah. yeah, and we hope to see you all as well at the Negon um, Sinclair. Um, panel Big shout well. out to Alexis Walker. Thanks so much for for moderating mm -hmm. this session and, and for being in, in relationship with us. It means a lot uh, to, mm -hmm. to have you here. So thank you for everything you've done to support us in facilitating this workshop. Diane, I see your question saying uh, there's a teacher webinar. There is a teacher webinar coming up. Uh, it's open to any YPI teachers that are currently enrolled or hoping to enroll or thinking of enrolling. And so if that's something that uh, is useful or helpful, we will be re re uh, pre-recording pre-recording that session, I should say. Uh, and if there's, uh, if it's useful for folks that uh, might be outside of the YPI program or enrollment for us to make that publicly accessible to everybody so we can all benefit from it, happy to reconsider that and consider that with the team, uh, Holly, and I can bring that back to the team. But yes, we do have a webinar coming up on Wednesday, October 27th in the evening. So happy to stick around for a couple minutes. We know folks might be popping out, going elsewhere. We totally get that. Thank you all for that. The info about the webinar is not on our website, Erin, but if uh, you wanted to pass me your email uh, directly in a direct message, happy to loop you in. Um, and yes, uh, Diane, feel free to reach out. Big thanks to everybody uh, who made this session possible. Thank you for engaging with us. Thank you for listening. And us. We know it's a, tr a tricky time. If there are any questions or comments, if anybody wants to unmute, uh, feel Feel free to, to jump in. We'll, Holly and I will be around for a couple more minutes before we switch gears. Hi, Erin. I see your camera and uh, um, your mic on. Do you do you did you have a question? It's nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you uh, face to face. I'm the one who's been sending you so many emails. <laughs> sorry, Erin. Yeah, oh, I recognized the, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the name right after. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> this was incredible. Um, I wanted to come. I wasn't sure what the YPI was about, um, but I I was hesitant because I heard philanthropy, and I was. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, I'm like, well, I'm kind of against philanthropy because I think that we should just tax the rich and make our society more equitable instead of just like using philanthropy to get around that notion. Right. Um, but wow, your organization really, is incredible. Really appreciate so, that. Yeah, we really appreciate that. We want you to know that we uh, challenge notions of philanthropy and that if philanthropy means what it means to most folks in terms of status quo knowledge or white normative knowledge is like white, rich, older folks giving money, that's not what we mean by when we say philanthropy. Um, there's wonderful work that's being done by the circle, um, which is who we give credit to in terms of our own learnings around traditional ways of sharing and giving Living within Indigenous cultures, uh, Indigenous ways of knowing that, quite frankly, they've been doing philanthropy for uh, thousands of years. It just wasn't named that or recognized as that. And so that's the angle that we come at it from. Um, definitely hear you about taxing, you know, taxing folks and that, you know, dismantling these the systems and inequity um, that exists and unearned wealth and hoarded wealth. Those are all conversations that we are very open to having and that we do have within our within our team for sure. Um, disrupting those notions for sure and celebrating other ways of, of giving and sharing that exist. So is the best way to just enroll my school or contact you directly or... Yeah, there's, there's a few ways. So if you visit our website at goypi.org, there is a school application form. I can even take a moment to drop that into the chat and then okay. enroll it. You have to complete an application form and then uh, we uh, we work through the enrollment process with you. I'm actually part, I work directly with the school. So I design a lot of the resources. Uh, I work on leading the curriculum. And so we would be in contact uh, and we would have a conversation about getting your school on board, what your context is, what supports uh, you and your students need and then we try to you know accommodate be adaptable and as flexible as possible to ensure that uh you know you and the students have an opportunity to experience the program and hopefully have it be a meaningful and enriching opportunity as well um so happy to drop that link in the in the chat for you if that helps or yes um, reply via email you let me know your preference i'm sure if there's some folks left on here it might be useful as well yeah 
Yeah, and the, the webinar, um, how to have challenging conversations or difficult conversations, sorry, with students, that, that's happening next Wednesday. And that's open to yeah, that schools that are in the process of considering joining YPI. So if you're, you'd be very much, uh, very Yeah, welcome. I'm going to uh, also email that to my consultant. Okay. <laughs> is, uh, is that webinar being recorded? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cause I would love to, unfortunately I have a prior engagement, but I, that is actually something that I really need some support with. As I indicated in the chat, it, my concern is always when the kids kind of do that pushback, how do you have those safe conversations then for your other students in the class mm -hmm. when you have kids that are pushing back? Cause I don't want to create harm for like, you know, like you, when you come in and you have the resources, the education, the knowledge, but then you have the negativity in the room. How do you make sure that it is still safe for your other students? So that's where I really need some support. Yeah, and we, we, we directly address that. I'll be co-leading that uh, that webinar with uh, two of my colleagues that are present today. But Alexis, it's definitely being pre-recorded. I overwhelmingly hear those requests. Uh, I get those requests and those calls to my inbox mm. constantly. Like uh, I get called into classrooms to try to navigate those conversations uh, for the teachers to model it so that they have a mm. sense of, of what's going on. So that's why we created the webinar. Definitely going to be uh, pre-recorded and shared with all our YPI teachers and our uh, leads as well. So you'll have a copy of that. And I think we actually directly address an example, just like the one that you gave, uh, 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 like we use a concrete example example, of course, um, we don't reveal any sort of uh, confidential markers of our teachers or our schools. Of course, we respect everybody and honor everybody's positions, but uh, I hope that um, definitely we'll get that to you. And I, I, I imagine it would be a, a support. And also like, I'm here for that reason too, right? Like if I can support uh, being, you know, if I support shadowing your classroom or being there and helping you navigate like that is also support what we mean by supporting our teachers right it's not just like links to resources like sometimes it's modeling it's modeling that tension modeling how do you talk about difficult knowledge difficult truths now i'm getting pushback i'm getting pushback and resistance that's actually supporting the status quo it's not supporting empathy openness humility what do i do with that um, like these are all very real things that play out as you know for teachers and educators and so yeah definitely we'll be sharing that um but there's not you. enough people like you that are addressing it <laughs> yeah a lot of people don't want to deal uh don't want to bring that up to the forefront because we're we're told that uh you know a, t a classroom teacher is supposed to just know everything You're supposed to be the authority on everything figure it out if you need help that's bad classroom management and that is a lack of professionalism on your part all of these notions are really harmful and dangerous not just for teachers um but for the students that are in their care and so i think being able to be open about these struggles is like part of what teaching is is all about right it's abandoning perfectionism being like i don't know how to how to do this right and we'll figure it out together because it's going to look differently classroom to classroom teacher to teacher um it requires a certain level of of humility to be able to say i don't know you know i'm not sure but i i'd like to figure it out you know and i that veil of professionalism that can sometimes get in the way of us doing that. We're, we're signaled even as adults, just like students, don't be vulnerable. Don't share your weakness. What would, what would be labeled as a weakness, right? Um, we could chat for hours, I think. Oh my God. Like everything you're saying, I'm just like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So Andrew, I, do, I just want to don't want to interrupt okay. here, but uh, the next plenary is starting pretty quick. So we do need to wrap up here. It's starting in a okay. few minutes time. Thanks. Jeff. I just have one more question. Do I apply with my class or do I apply? So go for it, Holly. Yeah, sure. So we uh, we work across the whole grade level. Okay. Um, for new schools to us, we can work with fewer than, than the whole grade level, but the idea is that we're working towards inclusion across the entire ninth or 10th grade. And so okay. that's usually done by running it in any mandatory course. And so, right. but the, the first year that a school participates with us, that, that, um, is waived and also during COVID, of course, that requirement is waived as well, because there's, it wouldn't be inclusive to, to cancel registration for schools that um, are supporting their students with multiple different um is it possible to do a grade grade 11 
or no? Does it have we to be- can, we've made, I think we've made exceptions before. Um, so we okay. could, we could definitely talk about I'm it. I'm only teaching grade 11 courses. Yeah. Re- okay. I, it sounds like before you apply, maybe having a conversation with us first, even yeah. if you email info at goypi.org um, okay. and just say, I'm Erin, I was in the uh, Nora and Holly's workshop, and then we'll, um, we'll set up a time to chat with you. Okay. Info at YPI. Okay. Thank uh, you. Info, go, go YPI. Go YPI. I just put it in the chat for you as yeah. well. Uh, thank you. Okay. Amazing. So nice thank to meet you, you Aaron. Nice to so meet you, nice Aaron. To meet you. And everybody on the call. You guys are your... awesome. Thank you for what you're doing. So needed yeah. and so necessary. Same back so. at you. Absolutely welcome. Thanks for your service, everything you're mm-hmm. doing and have done unrelated to YPI because we know it's been a rough year. So thanks, everybody. Thanks for that support in the back end. We hope and wish that the remainder of the conference is fruitful, that you all have a wonderful time. And we look forward to being in touch if you choose to be in relationship with us, the work that we're hoping to do, trying to do, messing up, but still doing anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy, your, <laughs> enjoy your 15 minutes before your, your next session. For how next time. Time. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so, much, for being Thanks with so us. much. Thanks again, Alexis. So good to see you. <laughs> Yeah. Big shout out. Thanks Bye. so much. Be safe. Be well out there. Have a great Thanks, one. Jeff. Everybody.